for this JCAV TV interview. I'm your host, Molly Baumgartner. I'm also a professor here at Johnson County Community College. Now, my guest today is an international performer, and he's the founder of Healing of Magic program, Kevin Spencer. Kevin, thank you for being here. It's nice to be here. Um, now, you're here at Johnson County Community College to present some training workshops, and you're also serving as our keynote speaker for the Autism Across the Lifespan Conference. Um, could you start by just telling us a little bit about how long you've been involved in magic? Oh, wow. I started doing magic when I was a kid. I can remember uh, seeing a magician perform on television when I was five and telling my mom, when I grow up, I'm going to be a magician. And here you are. And here I am. Here. As every good Midwestern mom does, she <laughs> patted me on the head and said, you can do whatever you want to if you put your mind to it. There we go. So what led you to develop it in the Healing of Magic program? All of that is a pretty personal experience for me. Uh, very early in my magic career, I was involved in a really bad automobile accident. Uh, the car I was in was hit and crushed by a tractor trailer. And all I remember is that I woke up in neurological intensive care with a closed brain injury and a lower spinal cord injury. And I spent the next year in uh, rehabilitation, just working hard to regain all the skills that I'd lost as a result of the accident. A lot of things starting over from square one and just kind of working your way through. And what I remember most vividly about that was that uh, sometimes it was incredibly frustrating, uh, difficult, but it was really boring. That's the part that I remember the most. You know, it's, it's so tedious and I'm a very logical sort of thinker and some of the things they wanted me to do just didn't seem to make sense to me. I couldn't understand where that was going. So I had wonderful, wonderful therapists and I came out on the very good side of such a traumatic accident. But I sat down with the head of my rehabilitation department and just said, can we find a more exciting motivating way to do this. And as a magician, all I could think of was all of these simple little magic tricks that I had learned as a child. So we brought those out and started to look at them, to dissect them, and realized that all the movements that are required to perform a simple magic trick are the same movements that are required to do some of the more traditional forms of therapy. But they're just so much more fun than putting pegs in a board. So we started to use magic tricks in, in our hospital with some stroke patients and had amazing results. And then we moved into head injury, spinal cord injury, into the psych ward. And then the program just really started to spread across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And today it's in about um, 2,000 hospitals and rehab centers in 30 countries around the world. That's wonderful. Now, we don't often have guests that bring some props with them. <laughs> Would you show us? Let's start with, just show us one trick. You know, I think one of the ones that we teach a lot, and this is my favorite one, there's no better way to get somebody motivated than to bring out money. So uh, this is a really great trick. It's an easy trick, but the processing and all of the motor movements are, are very, very th therapeutic. So you just show the dollar bill and you bend it over just so that it covers up George Washington's face. And you put your first paper clip on right here on top of the number one. And then you bend it backwards. And inside the little tunnel, you put your second paper clip on. So you have one paper clip on this side and one paper clip on this side, but they don't touch anywhere in the center. And then when you grab the two top corners and you pull, the paper clips jump up in the air and they link together. Uh, it's a very cool trick and it's very addictive. Once you do it once, you just kind of want to take it apart and do it again. We just finished working with some of the uh, clear students here on campus and this was one of the tricks that we taught them. And it was so wild to kind of watch across the room and just see paper clips flying everywhere through the air and then listening to the laughter that happens across the, the room. It's Absolutely. pretty cool. Now, most people don't think with a magician that we're going to get um, involvement in education research, but that's also your <laughs> forte. So what does your data tell us about the impact of integrating the arts with a learning process for children? I think the most important thing, the most critical factor for children to learn is motivation. Mm 
If they're not motivated to learn something, then they're just not going to do it. And some of the most recent research that just came out this month, actually, from uh, the University of California, Davis, talked about the link between curiosity and learning and curiosity and memory, and then those links that make it over to behavior. Your brain has a way of, when you're interested in something, when you're curious about something, your brain kind of grabs that information and sorts it and then stores it away. So what we try to do with magic is tap into the natural inquisitiveness, the natural curiosity inside of every child. And we build on that. If you can use a magic trick to teach a child, like with this simple little trick, we're looking at things like planning and sequencing, organizing tasks and movements, concentration and focus, all of the fine and motor skills that are required to put this on. And inside this simple little magic trick are nine physics formulas and three math formulas that we can take even into gifted and exceptional and help them take very abstract concepts and make them very concrete through the performance of a magic trick. It taps into what we call the three aspects of learning. Magic is visual, mm -hmm. it's oral, and it's kinesthetic. And anytime they can see it, they can do it, they're involved with it, we remember that information so much more. So it's not just about learning the trick, but the academic content that goes along with it. Very good. Now you've developed the Hocus Focus curriculum. Tell us about that curriculum. This was, after I finished my accident and came out of the therapy and I'm talking to therapists about magic, I, around 2006 I found myself working with a lot of children in clinics, in hospitals, kids who had rigidity or social skills problems, some problems with maybe dexterity and some cognitive processes. And so I had to ask myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. Why are we not working with these children in the school system rather than in the hospital? Especially when we talk about inclusion in our school system. And one of the things that I think kind of troubles me a bit about inclusion is sometimes we interpret that to mean present mm -hmm. but not included. And we bring these children into our classroom but they're still not a part of what it is that we do. So I wanted to develop a curriculum that would be truly inclusive that would work with neurotypically developing children in the same that it would, way that it would work with children who had learning challenges. So I sat down and developed a protocol of magic tricks that we knew would work every single time, and then we built a curriculum around those tricks that aligns to state, national, and common core standards of learning from third to twelfth grade. And so every trick has a language arts, a math, or a science component that goes with it, but it also gives children this opportunity to perform to present, to learn how to stand in front of a group and to, to communicate effectively and appropriately. So um, we put that curriculum out into about 40 schools across the country, gathered all of that data, and then published that data in 2012 in the Journal of the International Association of Special Education. I was specifically working towards special needs kids, mm -hmm. but what we found is that children are just children. And if you give them something that excites them and motivates them about learning, they're all going to learn it. And, and what was so cool is so many times, especially our kids on the autism spectrum, they would capture the concept of the magic trick very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you saw those children actually teaching the other children how to do the trick. So that was kind of a, an extra perk, I there think. There you go. But your statement just now le leads me to my very next question, and it is about children on the autism spectrum. Could you share with our viewers some of the learning and social issues that kids that are diagnosed as being on the spectrum, what kind of issues are they dealing with? You know, the spectrum is so uh, wide and mm -hmm. deep. And, and some of my education colleagues always say, we're, we're all on the spectrum somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? But I think the biggest challenges that they have are mostly in, 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 so in that organizing and planning stage, the social aspect. They're very socially awkward, sometimes don't want to engage because they're not comfortable in engaging. They have a lot of dexterity issues with fine motor coordination, uh, some communication problems and sensory issues. So all of those things can be addressed by learning to perform a magic trick because it brings all of those elements together in a really fun way and in a way that the child doesn't even realize that they're doing something educational or therapeutic. The ultimate goal for them is to perform the magic trick. What we found with magic is it really kind of works on three levels. It's about dexterity. They have to be able to manipulate the props in order to do the trick. So they work very, very hard to do that. The motivation to learn the trick is very high because it's something that can't be, um, that maybe can't be 
duplicated by some of their peers. Mm -hmm. And so that gives them this kind of novelty. And so if you went to one of these children and you said, I need you to do this 10 times every day for the next week, good luck with that. Right. But if I can give them a magic trick that incorporates that movement, they're gonna work on that magic trick over and over and over again and do all of those movements without thinking about the fact that they're doing those movements. And then of course the last thing that magic does is it works at a very social level. Magic doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Once you learn the trick, you instantly want to show it to somebody else and that gives you this opportunity to engage with somebody. And so for kids on the spectrum, it allows us to teach them the give and take of conversation. One of the biggest things uh, that's a challenge for kids on the spectrum is this concept of theory of mind, that um, what I'm thinking as someone on the spectrum could be different than what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. So with a magic trick, we can actually help them understand that. If they can identify the secret move in a magic trick, and then if they can observe the way you respond when they perform that trick, it helps them to understand your expressions, your facial expressions, your sense of emotion if you go, well, that was pretty cool. Then they can ask themselves, okay, now why did they respond like right. that? And it also teaches them that there's a different perspective to things. Magic, when you know the secret, just doesn't seem magical at all. You're just kind of sitting back and it's a series of moves. But when you show that to somebody else and they respond, it allows that, that child, that individual, to kind of look at that and go, wow, this series of moves generates that kind of response. This secret move, gets that sort of an expression and it kind of helps them understand that these are the way things connect. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm thinking right now is I'd like to see another another one trick. Of your <laughs> <laughs> this one I have to say is my is my favorite one. This is a part of the Hocus Focus curriculum and it's all about math. And typically when we would perform this, we would throw this out and we would let everybody examine the ropes. So you have this long rope, you have this medium-sized rope and then you have this little short rope. And they're all just three pieces of rope, very, very mm -hmm. solid. So what we do is we bring the short end of the rope up to the short end, the medium end of the rope to the medium end, and the long end of the rope up to the long end. So that you can make these kind of look like they're the same size here, mm -hmm. but they're still messed up here, unless you do this. <whistles> and then you can end up with one, medium-sized piece of rope, two medium-sized pieces of rope, and three medium-sized pieces okay, of rope. <laughs> did you get that figured out? The yeah. cool part about that, <laughs> and the cool part about this is when you can pass them back to your hand and pull out one short piece of rope, one medium-sized piece of rope, and one long piece of rope. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Um, well, tell me, because I think by now you've piqued the interest of the viewers, where can parents and teachers and therapists that don't already have this curriculum, where can they find the Hocus Focus curriculum? There is a website. It's hocusfocuseducation.com. They can find a lot of information there. There's a lot of information on uh, how magic and why magic works with children on the autism spectrum. A lot of the research is there. They can just click on the research button and go over to some of the research and read about that. Uh, and then there's a link for resources and the curriculum there as well. You know, I'm really excited. Kansas is, is amazing to me because I have done more research in the state of Kansas than I probably have anywhere else in the world. And I have had a lot of research projects. I've had them in Australia and in, in Ireland and London, throughout Europe. But this summer we actually partnered with Kansas State University uh, to do the first multidisciplinary arts integrated intervention specifically designed for kids with autism and ADHD using magic tricks to gauge the impact on executive function skills. And it was, a, it was phenomenal. We're still trying to aggregate so much of the data, but anecdotally we could see just huge changes in these children. So one of the things that we're doing here with Johnson County Community College is on Friday I'm going to be doing a professional development workshop with teachers about the Hocus Focus curriculum. Uh, they all have a copy. We're going to go through the curriculum, kind of evaluate how they can make this adaptive to the needs of the students in their classrooms. And then over the next, uh, starting in January, over that the spring semester, we are going to take about 20 schools, reaching about 1,500 students with special needs, to um, evaluate the student growth and progress using magic tricks across a number of domains. So right now we are in the process of psychometrically validating the 
the instrument mm -hmm. and then the instrument will be given to those teachers and then the teachers are so excited I'm so excited who gets to bring magic tricks into a classroom I mean I wish I wasn't you know a kid doing magic tricks in my class and I did but I got in trouble for it so it's so much better if you can do them and you can learn from the entire process there you go now your website shares that one in six children in the United States are diagnosed with a developmental disability so you're here on our campus because we have our annual conference, the Autism Across the Lifespan. But what are some of the other things that you're doing while you're here with us for these couple days? We, we have a busy schedule. I'm really thankful. There's one thing I hate is just to come into a community and be in my hotel. So this has been great. Yesterday we spent all day yesterday doing a continuing education workshop for physical and occupational therapists, teaching them how they can use simple magic tricks in physical and psychosocial rehab and some of the clients that they work with. This morning we worked with the CLEAR program here on campus, which was great. Those kids were fantastic. And that program's designed for kids that live in our metro area that have developmental disabilities, okay? And, and, and I think what was so exciting is that like with the with the paperclip trick, once you master the trick, then you have to turn that into a story. Mm -hmm. And you have to share something, because you can't just go home to your friends and say, hey, watch me link these paperclips together, because that's kind of lame. You have to have a really great story that frames it. So they came up with their stories, and one by one, they would get up in front of the class and they would perform. And it was so interesting for me to watch the teachers across the back. Um, be amazed at somebody who got up in front of the classroom and presented the trick and told their story. And so many times you learn things about your students that you didn't know because I think this is one of the most powerful things about the arts. It gives you this platform, this opportunity to share sometimes more personally in a really safe environment what you're experiencing and some of the things that you're going through in your life. Uh, it gives you a voice. Mm -hmm. and there's not many opportunities that we have in society anymore to have a voice in a safe environment where you can say, this is what I'm going through, this is what's happening to me. And for those, that population of people, I think it's really important to give them a voice. And where are you going this afternoon? This afternoon we're at the Lake Mary Center. Mm -hmm. It's working with, with uh, that group of clients. And then back here this afternoon, we're working with the Autism Club. And then tomorrow morning kicks off the Autism Conference, which I'm very excited about. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, you and your wife travel around the world performing illusion tricks and sharing your professional expertise. And I'm curious, is there a common issue or concern that you hear um, regardless of the geographic location that you're visiting? That's a great question. Um, and, and you know, in all the research that you read, you, you they, they don't want to really talk about autism as an epidemic sort of thing. Um, and this year with the changes in the DSM-5 about what exactly is autism and kind of removing that Asperger's classification and putting it all together, um, this, is a, this is an international prevalence that we see. Uh, and researchers are really scrambling internationally to kind of find ways to better socialize and educate children who have autism or developmental delays. Uh, some of the research that just came out of South Korea last year shows that one in 35 kids in South Korea are diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Uh, I have a nonprofit called Hocus Focus that has made a commitment to working with vulnerable children in post-conflict developing countries. So we do a lot of work with um, children in Uganda and I spend a lot of time in Uganda and the one thing that we find there you show up and they have all these first of all they have a lot of developmental delays or, or disabilities that we cured in our country a long long time ago so it's hard to get past seeing things that we haven't seen in 30 40 years here but when you start to look beyond that layer it is interesting to see even the number of children in very tribal areas of Uganda that are on the autism spectrum. So I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not in the, the research aspect of trying to find the neurological part of this. I just feel like my biggest goal is to find a way to help these individuals integrate into society in a really comfortable and positive way and to try to raise the awareness of those of us who don't consider ourselves <laughs> to be on the spectrum to realize that they have the same hopes and dreams that you and I do, but their futures are so often molded by our attitudes and perceptions about who they are. And if we limit them, they will be limited. 
and if we just put no limitations on them, they are capable of doing remarkable things. Okay. We talk about the research. We talk about your magic. We talk about the work that you're doing with educators. It, it appears that you're involved in another venture. Um, I, I saw that Powerful Medicine Simply Magic is a film and that it has been chosen as a finalist for the Out of the Box Film Festival in California. Tell, <laughs> tell us about your filmmaking career and, and where can we see this film? It seems like when you, when you kind of lay them out like that, it seems like I'm a little scattered, doesn't it? I, I try to be very focused in all of those areas. Uh, this film for me was um, a passion. All of these kids that I've had the privilege of working with, all of these individuals I've had the privilege of working with, I just felt like it was time to bring them out of the shadows and into the spotlight. Again, to give them a voice to, to show people that they can really do amazing and remarkable things. So Powerful Medicine Simply Magic is not a film about me. It's about these awesome people that I've had the privilege of working with. And one of the main features in this is a gentleman named Trent. Trent's 24, lives in Chicago. Uh, a lot of problems. Trent was uh, born with a traumatic brain injury, had a stroke before he was born in the birth canal, and so he has a lot of sensory issues. And the doctors really said Trent wouldn't be able to do much, but Trent discovered magic around the age of 13. And since that time, he's developed all of these wonderful social skills. He's hemiplegic. Everyone in the film, even the, the second group of children that we work with in London, are all hemiplegic. So they have paralysis on one side of their body. And yet, through magic, we were able to motivate them to start using those arms in a really productive way. And you get to see some of these kids perform. It, to me, it's a, it's a short documentary. It's 23 minutes. And we have it out to a lot of different film festivals right now. Totally excited that we got into the Out of the Box Film Festival. Uh, people can check it out online. I know it's available on demand at, at Vimeo. At, uh, they can go to simplymagicthefilm.com okay. and they can see it there. Or if they really want to find out a lot of information about the work that we're doing, jointhemove.com. Kind of gives you an overview of everything that we're trying to do in the disability community. Okay, so before you leave, one last, I see you've got one last cross. Let's Let's see how that works. This has got to be one of my favorite tricks. And we teach this to a lot of our, our children because it, it's, it's such a motivating trick. And it's all about counting. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Hold your hand out for me like this. I'm going to take this one, I'm going to put it in my hand. This one, I'm going to give it to you. So you hang on to that really tight. So we go like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we have it. <laughs> Thank you again to our guest. Our Thank educator, you. Our illusionist, researcher. Um, I would say performer extraordinaire. Um, Kevin Spencer, thank you for so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you for being with us, for learning more about kids that are on the developmental autism spectrum disorder and about some of the great things that we're doing here at Johnson County Community College. I'm your host, Molly Baumgartner. Keep tuning. <laughs>